thrombosis.tv here at the ISTH 2015 conference in Toronto. Thomas Baldrick along with Dr. Elaine Heilek, Professor of Medicine at Boston University. Thank you for spending a few moments with us. Sure. Let's talk first about patients who are taking uh, dabigatran. For them, what is the risk of major bleeding? Well, I'm perhaps most familiar with the atrial fibrillation indication with dabigatran. And we have to remember that atrial fibrillation is an entity that really occurs in older adults, uh, such that about 10 to 12 percent of individuals over age 80 um, actually have atrial fibrillation. So the most common clinical conundrum, so to speak, uh, with this age group is that as the risk of stroke increases, so does the risk of bleeding. Um, in the clinical trial RELY, uh, the most amazing results uh, with dabigatran was a dramatic reduction in intracranial hemorrhage, um, I believe by about 50 to 70 percent reduction in the most feared complication of anticoagulants. But important to remember that all of these drugs are blood thinners and all of these drugs are going to have some level of bleeding. Um, in the clinical trial, again, coming back to rely, and I think what, what has been confirmed in several studies now in clinical practice, is that the, the incidence of major bleeding, um, specifically on dabigatran, is about 3%, uh, somewhere in that realm. And I think that that's a, that's a reproducible um, level of bleeding. Um, but again, remembering that the intracranial hemorrhage bleeding was markedly reduced compared to warfarin. But for other types of bleeding, for example, gastrointestinal bleeding, um, specifically, that's the largest area of bleeding in the older adult. Um, it was similar to warfarin in the trial. In patients who are bleeding today, what do you see as the best treatments for managing them? Well, I think it's important for healthcare providers, emergency room physicians, you know, doctors, hematologists, pharmacists, to realize that because of the half-life of these drugs, um, dabigatran having a half-life of about 10 hours with, you know, good renal function, that most of the time um, individuals will be very adequately uh, cared for with supportive measures. You know, meaning you're withholding the drug, withholding the anticoagulant, questioning the, the need for aspirin therapy. Um, the supportive measures, you know, giving someone transfusion, making sure they're hemodynamically stable. So that what we anticipate um, is that the, the really life-threatening, severe type of bleeding is not uh, going to be uh, something that's going to be occurring frequently. And, you know, to be honest, I mean, we know this from the trials, that all of the trials on these DOAX or NOAX drugs, there was a trend uh, toward reduced mortality, a trend toward decreased bleeding, or no, statistically significant um, decreased bleeding in critical anatomic sites, uh, specifically intracranials. How do you see this specific clinical agent, Bigatran, being used in practice? So, you know, currently there's, we don't have a lot of evidence on what to do um, when someone presents with a life-threatening hemorrhage, and we can discuss what, what that might be. Um, but we would be, you know, at my institution and others, we would be using right now uh, the prothrombin complex concentrates. Um, and I think there is some data, but very limited data in that realm, but that would be the first go-to, um, I think, in emergency departments for someone who's really having a life-threatening hemorrhage, um, which is the reason that, you know, at the ISTH meeting today, you know, hearing about the results of reverse AD, um, this antibody looks very promising at really almost completely 99%, I believe, um, reversing the effect of dabigatran. So I think, you know, in individuals, for example, what type of bleeding would, would warrant? When I say severe life-threatening, we're talking about aortic dissections, retroperitoneal bleeds, um, even intracranial hemorrhages, and I think that there is hope um, that we can have an impact there, but that, uh, you know, oftentimes these patients present late to the emergency room, and, and we need to, from a public health perspective, understand for that, that small, infrequent complication, how we can really uh, have an impact on getting those patients uh, turned around quicker. Very good, Dr. Heilig. Thanks for coming by. Come back and see us again, would you? Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay.